Welcome to The Impossible, where we empower others to face the impossible, inspire them to be impossible, and motivate them to do the impossible. I'm Matt, and we're here with our brother, Austin Douglas. Guys, we got a really <clears throat> special one for you tonight, one that I think is going to evolve into its own series as we walk you through this journey that Austin is now on. Life, as so many have described it, can be defined by the suffering you're able to endure, the adversity you're able to overcome, the tragedy that you can accept in life, and more than that, turn it into triumph. And I think so many of our hardships in life can come from times when we feel lost and we feel like we have nothing to fight, nothing to chase, nothing to pursue. Those times where we are without purpose. That's why we emphasize so heavily the need of creating purpose for your life. True purpose comes with true adversity. Sometimes that adversity can be chosen. Sometimes it can be thrust upon us. Sometimes it is the very last thing we ever wish to endure. Yet, in that adversity, there is always limitless potential. There is always the impossible. And because of the nature of that existence, it becomes our responsibility to accept that adversity, to face that impossible and build the version of ourselves, an impossible version of ourselves, a version of ourselves that never should have, could have, or would have existed otherwise. That person will do the impossible. And it is our duty to give that person to the world to help those who need it most. And that is a perfect description of what our co-founder, Austin, is doing right now in his life. He never chose cancer. He never wanted to fight this fight. Nobody ever wanted it for him. He never chose to fail the initial treatment and move on to a clinical trial. He never chose to come out of that and face a relapse where he had to go on an experimental therapy. And he especially never chose for that experimental therapy to ultimately fail, leading him to his third battle with the same disease. There's so many stories out there that reflect his, but there are very few that contain the same approach, the same fortitude, and the same pursuit that his does. So we want to use this time, this opportunity to be able to show you guys what it can look like from the ground floor to face not just cancer, but any tragedy, tragedy in life. How you can take the raw and real moments and face them, feel them, live in them. And how you can use that to build strength. There are not always times where it's easy. There's times where you break down. There's times where you want to give up. There's times where you don't want to continue on. That's normal. That's human. That's part of the process of building 
this impossible version of yourself. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> all it takes is a continual drive toward that individual you know you are building. And if you show up with that drive every single day, you will overcome any tragedy in life. So Austin is using this time not just to focus on this, his own battle that he's been confronted with, but he's using it as a first-hand direct account to show everyone exactly what this message can do in your life, how you can use it to face any tragedy, and most importantly, how you can become impossible yourself in the face of something truly impossible. This next series will be a first-hand account of one man's battle, one man's journey through tragedy, and how he finds triumph, not at the end, but in the day-to-day, -day, battling this adversity, facing this impossible. We wanted to share you with you guys every single experience along the way because we've always felt on the show that it's best to keep it honest, to keep it real, to keep it true to what is exactly happening. There's so much media out there today where you're only seeing the best of people's lives. You're only seeing what they want you to see. You're only seeing what they allow you to see. And while we certainly want to highlight those moments for you as well. We feel that it is infinitely more important to capture the moments of true tragedy, of true hardship, of true adversity. The moments where we ourselves face the impossible. Because that's life. And we want to keep that as real and honest for everyone as we possibly can because we know you will all face this in your lives we continue to face it in our lives and we believe that by keeping this discussion showing this true narrative we can also show the true strength that can exist within these moments it helps to build ourselves up in our fight and we hope that it will help to build all of you up in your own fight so that we can together as we say in our mission and vision at the beginning and the end of every episode have that global culture of strength where we are all growing and constantly pursuing the impossible so glad to have you here brother oh absolutely thrilled to be here and happy to be able to well one make somewhat of an attempt to try to follow that introduction <laughs> <laughs> that was incredible um happy to be here to be able to to share this story with you and, and everybody as you as you hinted towards there is that this is an opportunity for me to really really show everyone the the nitty gritty the somewhat confrontational and battle ready kind of position that in this case cancer is taking against me against my overall existence i mean it, this is this is a threat this is a threat to, to to my experience of this reality this is a threat towards my life and in the face of that threat i've through through the through the impossible i've been able to find myself ready to to stare back at it and and not only 
put up my shield, ready my sword, and run at it, but the intent and the purpose that I have propelling me forward towards it is in itself unrelenting. And and that really is a beautiful thing to be able to experience in these moments, is that I have <laughs> unrelenting, unwavering, and... Somewhat feels a bit undeserved, but the support that I have from, from everybody going into this has been more than I could ever ask for or even dream of. And that that has sent me into these sort of mental convulsions of where did this come from? How How did I deserve this? How did I how did I become in this position? Not of just, this is now my second relapse, third time battling this, but what, what did I do to, to deserve this? The, the support of the community that, that, that we have been able to develop here. And, and ultimately my response to that in our, in our discussions and ultimately what we decided is especially with this series is what can i do to give back in in the presence of such of such warmth and not comfort though that certainly is within the intentions of those who of of of, of those who say anything and everything to me and that's perfectly fine but i i don't i don't seek i'm not seeking comfort in this i'm seeking <laughs> basically just to get through this yeah i'm going to get through it and i know that i'm not alone i know that there's such a tidal wave of 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 what feels like undeserved support, but it is there. It's unrelenting, and it it makes me feel so ready to 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 give back in this position and 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 take everybody through what I am actually and and genuinely experiencing with this because yeah we we tend as you said we tend not to share these darker darker moments and what what we've decided is to bring those darker moments to light. Not just the dark moments, not just the darker moments, but the darkest moments, every moment, whether it is dark or not. I mean, that's that's going to be the beauty of this process is that not everything is going to be, you know, over-encompassing and, and brooding with this negativity and this, you know, this like, you know, sort of orc cloud of despair. <laughs> like, it's it's going to be it's going to have its moments of, of of absolute beauty and tranquility and and that is what I am absolutely ecstatic to be able to share with with everybody. Absolutely. As we move out of the adaptation series and transition onto this next series, I think it's going to give you guys a perfect real life glimpse into what a journey of this capacity can look like. It doesn't necessarily have to be cancer. It can be so many other things in life, but there are these continual areas of true tragedy in life. And if you haven't faced one yet, you will. And we don't say that to be like <laughs> negative or demeaning or anything like that. It's just the pure reality of life. Yep. Life is tragedy but it is also triumph. One can it not exist without the other. And tragedy doesn't even necessarily have to be a negative word. Yes, we would never wish it on anyone, but it is a part of life. It is something we will all face. And the very best thing we can do 
is equip ourselves to deal with it in the best manner possible. And there is never an exact right way to deal with it. But the way you will take it and find the most purpose and gratitude and fulfillment from it is by overcoming it, enduring it, learning from it, building and growing from it so that when you come out the other side, and not even just when you come out the other side, but when you're living the very day-to-day process of it, you can use that tragedy to build triumph in yourself and in those around you. And in so many ways, that can be defined as the meaning of life. Taking the tragedy you face and building triumph from it in those around you. And that's exactly what Austin's doing right now. And so we're going to give you guys a regular weekly update showing what this is like. The good, the bad, the ugly, the strength, the weakness, the confusion, the clarity, everything that is enveloped in this journey. And today we're going to go back to a, we're going to give you that, what David Goggins would call that week one, day one mentality. Because we've given you several instances now of what it's like to face this build to the climax, to face this uncertainty. Do I have cancer? Do I not have cancer? To even face the diagnosis of you have cancer. But anybody who's ever battled through this time knows that that is like, that is a very specific, unique part of this journey. But it always feels like this calm, haunting, quiet place where you're waiting for the floodgates to open. I always think about it in terms of those movies where they're showing D-Day and the people are riding in the boats and the, you know, they're the, until they get to a certain point, the boats are kind of rocking and it's quiet and they're traveling and it's dark and everybody knows that something of maximal intensity is about to unfold, but nobody knows what it's going to be, what it's going to be like until those shells start hitting the water, until the ramp of that boat goes down, until they're ejected out of their boat, thrown into the ice cold water with no orientation and have to find shore. Only until they do find shore And it's more treacherous than the water was. So we're going to go back and show you guys today what it's like in this battle to land on that shore and to find even more hardship than you thought you were already were in. Austin started chemo one week ago. And even though he's been there before, he's been on chemo, he's sat in that chair before, he's endured it countless times before, that day one is always an entirely unique experience. He's going to walk us through what happened that day, what he found in that day, what he learned in that day, what he's experienced since then. And what he's going to use going forward so that if you guys are in a moment right now where you're facing tragedy, you will be able to relate to his firsthand account of what he's experienced. And our hope and our mission is that we will all be able to come together using this to learn, to grow, to gain strength, to build an impossible version of ourselves in the midst of these battles we're facing. So I'm going to turn it over to Austin to let him explain to you from his perspective, what he experienced on this week, one day, one cycle, one day, one 
as it's used in chemo terms, as he landed on that shore, not quite knowing what to expect. So we get in 0800. I have the preemptive blood work. So go in there, donate a few uh, vials, and this is where, in this particular day, this is the moment to where the wave of reality hits you, is because they ask you if you want to leave the, in this case, IV in. And I say, yes. There have been so many times of recent, at least, that I've had blood work done to where I didn't have to say that. And having to say that, again, for a third time, um, was rough. And and the vein that she ultimately found uh, uh, was not, was not uh, up to par for the types of drugs that I was going to be experiencing in terms of their, uh, and their ability to damage and irritate uh, the vein and <laughs> unfortunately everything else that's within the body. But she comes out with the, uh, this vein finder machine and finds the vein, pops it in, takes the blood, Sends me up to the second floor. Second floor is where you go in for, uh, this is the hematology floor, at least other things, but at least the, the floor that I'll be on. And sitting there in the lobby, and I don't know if I called you or you called me, but got on the phone, and our uh, <laughs> fearless leader, Matt Hill, <laughs> is coming down the hallway and met up, uh, met up with me for, for this first treatment, which was crucial. <laughs> it was crucial. So, uh, so we get uh, get ready next. Uh, get ready for what's next, which is the meeting with. I was under the assumption that I was with my oncologist, uh, but it was not. It was with a uh, uh, certified nurse uh, practitioner, and she was ready to take all of our questions. Which, because it was Matt and I there, there were quite a few questions and. Uh, it was uh, it was a really good discussion. Certainly had some things answered. More questions arose from those uh, in terms of some of the details of medications that I'll be taking beyond the chemo, which which in my case here, coming into or going into a, a, a treatment session, I guess you can call it. There are a lot of things. There are a lot of other medications that you go through beyond the chemo, of course, or, or whatever, um, whatever therapy that you're actually taking. And in my case, there's a lot of anti. For everybody, there's anti nausea medication, but especially for me, there has to be a lot. Nausea and, and stomach irritation is just something that I, I succumb to with these, uh, with these sessions, and, and so we we brought that up to discussion and. Certainly, again, had some questions answered, but also more questions arose from that. Um, stuff that you just have to try to figure out. It's it's most certainly unique uh, to to each individual, and so kind of get some of those things hammered out um, as we're waiting for treatment. Um, and then it was nine forty five ten a.m. is where we are called into the room for for treatment itself. And so for this regiment, we're doing a, a, a combination of four drugs. The one immunotherapeutic drug is pembrolizumab. Um, it is an immunotherapeutic uh, PD-1 inhibitor. Um, and then we have three chemotherapeutic drugs, uh, gemcitabine, venerobine, and uh, liposomal liposomal doxorubicin. And as soon as we get into the room, um, another wave of reality kind of hits. And so we're just we're we're discussing with the nurse um, what precisely is 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 served up for the day in terms of what you know what medications are actually put in for the orders. 
and trying to make some adjustments to that and get started with the uh, with the uh, Pembro. Just use it short there instead of trying to say the full <laughs> full name every time. So with the Pembro, the immunotherapeutic drug, we get started with that. And it's a 30-minute IV uh, induction, I believe. Um, and so we get that started, and that's going smooth. The immunothera- immunotherapeutic uh, drugs, I would say I've, I've experienced little to no irritation in, in all-encompassing effects, which has been super nice in the past and, and, and as of now. But then we get to the liposomal doxorubicin. And this is where things get uh, get a bit haywire, unfortunately. So they start delivering it, and at this case, I, I've already had... Um, and, I, oh, excuse me. Anti-nausea medication, as well as some... I think I already had some Ativan at this point as well. So I was, I was certainly delirious, kind of just ready to sleep, which is kind of what I like to do mm-hmm. during these, uh, during the chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapeutic sessions is because I just, I don't, it's, it takes so long and with the machines, uh, noises, I just, I don't want to hear it. I just want to sleep. I, I reserve, I reserve these days of three, four, five, six hours of sleeping, not hearing, not seeing what's going on. I'm just, I'm experiencing it, but that's purely just having to sit there and, 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 and take the, take the drugs. So you're ready for the doxorubicin. It starts and in about five minutes or not five minutes, uh, like what, like 30 seconds. What, what did, how yeah, long was that? Cause I, was... cause I was kind of, <laughs> I was trying to fall asleep. Yeah. Well, you'd also received 50 milligrams of IV Benadryl. Oh, which yes, uh, yes. some of you may be able to re- relate to. Like, if you take a standard pill of Benadryl, like a whole pill, it's generally twenty-five milligrams. So, you know, depending on how sensitive you are, that can really knock you out. He got fifty milligrams IV, so he got a flooded bolus dose all at once, and it can, you know, it can help prevent reactions. It can help a little bit with preventing nausea, um, but it will it will definitely knock you out, make you yeah. very kind of out of its state really knock you out um not something i personally have have ever enjoyed at all (laughs) no no, Uh, it's a really weird state that puts you in but you were definitely kind of in and out of it and what's wild is she had hooked you up i don't even think you knew you were hooked up because i had to read your name and date of birth to her oh no (laughs) yeah Yeah. i don't remember because (laughs) she asked you and you weren't responding and she's like do you want me to wake him up i was like i don't think he would prefer to be woken up (laughs) so i gave her your name and date of birth and then she hooked you up it starts going and i actually have a video because the doxorubicin is this like bright red color and you can see it like pumping into the saline mixing in with the saline moving down the iv line i've got a video of that happening and again you were totally out of it and it wasn't 30 seconds into that infusion going into your vein and what's wild is we were sitting in this cleveland clinic room this is the first time i've been to this cancer center first time i've been to this health system so it's all new to me but i worked in oncology for eight years so i was always like you know studying seeing everything you know contemplating a lot of things and i remember right before this happened like minutes before this happened i was thinking i was looking around the room and i was thinking you know if somebody had an infusion reaction in here nobody would ever know about it and that just struck me so intensely i didn't say anything about it because obviously i didn't want to put that in anybody's head but i remember that striking my brain and then she comes in hooks this drug up and I'm not really thinking anything out of it. I just kind of dismiss that thought. She comes in, hooks the drug up. It starts pumping into your vein. And not 30 seconds later, you go from this like half asleep, like delirious state. And you like jolt up. And I see that look in your eyes. Thank God. <laughs> I had the experience in oncology. I did. I knew exactly what was happening. Because if I had been totally oblivious to what was going on, 
I would have had no idea what to do. Yeah. And I don't know that in the state you were in, you would have been able to be like, be of conscious mind enough to like know what was even happening yourself. He went into an immediate anaphylactic reaction, like a really bad one. We do see this time to time with certain chemo agents. Some of them are worse. Some of them are better. And it's something you've had before with one other agent. Although I don't think to this degree. No, no. So I hop up and I immediately hit the emergency button that's behind his bed. And, you know, fortunately the whole place explodes. The nursing team comes in, they pull a crash cart. They're pushing all kinds of medications. There's 10 or 12 people in his room. I pop out of the room because I know there's nothing I can do at that point. And I would just be more in the way than anything. Um, I pop out of the room and I'm trying to talk to you. I don't even know if you heard me, but it was just such an intense, profound moment because it's the very first 30 seconds of the very first chemotherapy agent. You already have a life threatening event. And I was curious to know because it's not something we've discussed a lot since that point, but I was curious to know, like, what did you feel? What did you notice? What did you observe from your standpoint as all of this is going on? Well, immediately, um, um, I, sorry, (laughs) I had felt, um, kind of like a, it feels like a fire starts in your chest and then fires up your throat. And so I was like, okay, this is definitely not something I'm supposed to be feeling. And then, and then that's the, um, like the elephant on your chest. It's just pressure started building up. First it was the fire and then, and then it was the pressure. Um, and then you can slowly like with with that fire feeling you kind of you, you slowly feel like the when you exhale on a breath you kind of vision like a like an up and down meter you breathe in and then breathe out well as it's happening the the depth of which you can breathe starts to become more and more shallow and so i would say by the time they all by the time everybody got in i was I was down to like 50% like breathing capacity and it just, it kept, it kept shortening from there. Um, and then they, as soon as they hit me with the Benadryl, um, I started to feel, feel some relief, but like the, the pressure and a little bit of the fire was still, still there pretty intently. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's ultimately what led me to very much questioning the the decision to 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 continue on with with taking the medication yeah because what's so profound about this moment is that i i was only able to be there kind of on a whim we were able to work around some last minute things and I was able to be there and for for some reason going into this I felt this like intense need to be there even though like logically you know you've done this before you faced this before you've gone through this cancer center before like there were a lot of things that like were not new to you about this necessarily Um, and by all means like you could have handled this by yourself. You could have faced this by yourself, but I felt this intense need to be there in like, because everything's happened very quickly. So it was like down to a week and days to turn this around and make this happen. Mm. And we get it set up to where I can be there. And, you know, everything seems business as usual. And then I have that weird thought hit me in that room that if somebody reacted, nobody would ever know. And then minutes later, you're reacting. You're having an anaphylactic reaction. Your chest is pounding. Your breathing is cut off. And not even just specifically me, but if somebody had not been there with you, you would have sat in that chair 
in that room for who knows how long not being able to breathe. Yeah. And that just shows the extreme intensity and extreme fragility of every single one of these situations. You know, the battle with chemo can ultimately be so intense because of the damaging effect it has over a long-term period on your body. But we talk about it all the time, how in so many cases it can be the treatment that can be so much more life-threatening than the disease, even though you have to endure the treatment in order to find a cure. This is a moment where in an instant, you know, his life could have ended there. But thankfully to, you know, the fact that we just had somebody else there with you Mm -hmm. who could sound the alarm for lack of a better term. And they really did have a great nursing staff that day that, you know, I've seen tons of reactions. I've seen tons of situations where they have to be handled. And I I really do think the nursing staff that day did a phenomenal job. Yeah, there were um, quite a few of of them and they're pretty quick. Yeah, and they, (laughs) you know, pushed the right medications. They stayed calm under the pressure and they were able to revive you and recover you fairly quickly as far as making that reaction specifically stop. But what's wild about this day is then that was not even the hardest thing you had to face. No, no. The hardest thing I had to face was having my oncologist come in and not so bluntly remind me that there is a ultimate goal and a task at hand that still needed to be accomplished and that I needed to continue to take the medication that I just had an allergic reaction to. And I did, I mean, I had, what, 20, 30 minutes to kind of think on that from making an initial decision, kind of just myself in the room and then having my oncologist come in and you know, talk it over. It wasn't a whole lot of talking, I suppose. It was more of this needs to happen. But but after after suffering that reaction, I, I had to decide to continue with the medication without really understanding the initial reaction of what they would need to do next because of my reaction. So their reaction was, okay, well, now, since this happened, we're going to deliver the same drug at half the rate. So half the half the rate of delivering it into my body. They'll, they'll cut that speed in half. And, of course, and I reserve every right <laughs> to, <laughs> to quadruple and quintuple check what they actually mean in that, oh no, we'll just cut the rate in half and that reduces the risk heavily of you having a reaction. I, I, do you really mean that? You know, <laughs> is, is that actually, is that actually protocol or are you just messing with me? Uh, that, I'm, I'm getting hyped right now just thinking about it because in that moment I was, I, I, I certainly made myself known, especially to the nurse that we had that day and like, it, it, <laughs> Thankfully for her having a level head and trying to deal with <laughs> deal with me, I suppose. But that was uh, that was an intense moment because I I had decided there I was like I'm not I'm not continuing treatment or the chemo like I'm I'm not I'm not doing it I'm done and I reserve the right to have made that decision ever so no matter how temporary it was I suppose but like I. I I was adamant that I was not continuing, and again, the oncologist came in, she very sternly, um, which is ultimately what I needed, uh, very sternly reminded us of, of, of what needed to be done, and I had to take a nice... In that moment, I didn't, I wasn't looking within myself. I wasn't looking 
out through the window. I was looking into... And actually just wrote about this last night. A um, bit of a kind of a pr profound eureka moment. Is that I, I looked into this sort of canvas. This imaginary canvas that I have that feels ever so real. More real than anything I can deal with here with my five senses. And that the canvas of what I've imagined my future of being, I had to uh, I had to I had to take a nice long look at what at what I and we very much intent on accomplishing. And it was so, <laughs> I, I could see that battle. I could see that struggle in your eyes. And it was so difficult for me to sit there and watch it because I knew there was, there was nothing I could do in that situation. Like I could, I could talk to you, I could speak to you, but that was an internal battle, an internal struggle you had to fight and wage entirely yourself. And guys, I want to emphasize this for you. Like what happened to him here? I'm sure everybody's known somebody in their life that has a peanut reaction or a peanut allergy. Like people can have severe peanut allergies where if they eat a peanut, they can have an anaphylactic reaction without an EpiPen, they could die. That's essentially what happened to Austin triggered by this medication that's like taking somebody giving them a whole jar of peanuts they eat a peanut and have an anaphylactic reaction have to be given multiple epi pens and then they finally you know come to they calm down they get everything figured out but they're still like reeling from the immediate threat that just happened to their whole life and then you look that person in the eye and say i'm going to need you to eat the rest of that container of peanuts who just had a life threatening reaction. Yeah. That's exactly what happened to him. And after receiving a minuscule amount of this drug, the oncologist looks him in the eyes and says, you have to get the rest of that. Plus two chemotherapy Plus drugs. Plus two after other that. chemotherapy <laughs> drugs. After that was the that. first one of three. Yeah. Uh, that's that. And that's what blew my mind. And I started bartering with myself. I was like, well, why can't, why can't I just, we'll just get rid of the doxorubicin. I'll take the, the, the GV. It'll be fine. Everything will be fine. And that still holds a little bit of candlelight in my, uh, in my warehouse. I'll definitely admit that. I still want to discuss that, but yeah, yeah, that was a very large jar of peanuts that I had to stare at and go, oh. So I just have to eat. Yeah, I have to eat them slower. That's what you're telling me. Is that I can't just get this done and over with. I have to now double the time of this rate, double the time of the of the time that's going to take to deliver this drug, which was already your longest which is, infusion, which is already an hour. So it's two hours. And. Now starting it an hour and a half after the fact that we wanted that we <laughs> that we tried to start it, and so a four four and a half hour day turned into about an about an eight hour day, um, and uh, it was longer than that. You showed up. At, you showed up at eight a.m. We didn't walk out of there till six o'clock. Oh yeah. Well, I meant like just just the treatment just session. Just the infusions. Yeah, itself, yeah just yeah. the infusion. Yeah, that yeah. was, which is longer than what I had for the Brintuximab, Vindotin, plus uh, ABD, with some doxorubicin in that too. Um, so, yeah, I... This was, a, this was a pivotal moment, I would say. And... Uh,
having having to turn my head back to my oncologist and tell her that we can continue with the medication we can continue with the infusions after just having this life-threatening experience i I had to I had to set aside a lot of fear that I had already dealt with. There was I was I was so ready. I was so I was so prepared going into that day that having that life-threatening experience just blew out all that foundation and i felt i i did crumble in that moment but it didn't actually take out my foundation it just it shook me because what i found myself where i found myself in that moment was 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 falling to my habits falling to the foundation of what I have built coming into this day and I was able to look look her in the eyes and say okay if it has to be done then we will continue and that I I very much enjoy like making eye contact with people when I'm talking to them. I I very much enjoy that uh social interaction even though I'm an introvert by heart. I I absolutely love love having those moments. Especially the 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 deeper the moment, the more intense the moment, the the more I feel it is required. And I have a strong feeling that my eyes were <laughs> were screaming something completely different in that moment looking at uh looking at her but and you and the trees outside cuz at least we get a decent view with the with the room that we have and yeah really turn a corner in that in that moment So, we continue on the, so like I said, or we said I had two more infusions to go. Uh, next was the gemcitabine, and then finished off with the venerelbine, and those go smoothly. Um, unfortunately, now I will say, was it was it during the rest of the doxorubicin, or was it into the venerelbine and gemcitabine that I was I was having more like more moments of like flare-ups I think it was mostly during because what we did is we ended up switching the order up to give your body a little as much of a break as possible after the reaction instead of going straight back to the doxorubicin we gave the gemcitabine and the venerelbine in the meantime I think it was during that time that you were still having like weird flare ups of that yeah. uh, burning sensation, which we likely believe is is resulting due to the just immense amount of chemicals your body dumps into the bloodstream in moments like that. Yeah. Uh, because basically, these are allergic reactions where the body's saying, "I want this out, I want this gone," and it goes level ten <laughs> to make that happen. Those. Uh, those chemicals can kind of, even though they come from your body, they can float around in the bloodstream for a while and leave some lasting effects for sure. It made me feel a bit floating as well. Yeah. <laughs> floating in limbo or something happier. I don't know. But yeah. yeah, so the other two drugs go take care of the doxorubicin. And we, we walk out of there. And you head home. I... Uh, stayed at a friend's house 
very very thankful for him to 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 keep uh, to to put me up for for uh, for the evening because um I didn't have any medication for anti nausea to take home and everything that was filled out for me was down here I was 3 hours away from relief and I did not get that relief at all I had to experience all of that all of the kind of consequences and the side effects of of not only just the chemo causing and you know causing stomach irritations just in general for me but everything that had happened that day all of that was just just lingering in my body for for what two and a half days before I finally drove down here and that was difficult in itself so this was two and a half days of just me like it just it, it felt like somebody punched me in the gut straight into the stomach multiple times. That's how it feels. That's what it feels like being on chemo for me. Like I, I have a little bit of fatigue. Um, some some like uh, the increased blood flow in the mouth. Like I could definitely feel like no matter how much liquids I have, like my, my tongue feels swollen and it just feels like my mouth is ready for mouth sores, which I'm <laughs> trying to prevent obviously. But that drive home took me took me about four and a half hours to do a it was actually about a two and a half hour drive um especially with how i drive <laughs> and <laughs> and it took me about four 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 and a half hours to to get back because i had to i had to continuously stop because i just even even on straightaways it was just so difficult to to deal with all of that um and i i drive all the time i enjoy driving that that day was not not fun at all, but I had to do it, had to do it. I got down here Saturday evening and immediately I'm so thankful he had all that stuff out because <laughs> I got back here. I, I took, I took a, a couple of pills, not just one. I took a couple and I was like, knock me out, you know, just, just get me into tomorrow. Um, and from there on, it's, it's slowly waning, but here we are recording the day prior of my day eight delivery of those three chemos. Yeah. And that's what I was going to emphasize is that was all that everything he just experienced was cycle one day one, just the very first day, the first doses of four total treatments and all of those four total treatments are just the introductory part to what's going to be the hardest part, that being the stem cell transplant, yeah. which we'll be talking to you guys in depth about as it arises and as it comes. And we've got actually some very intense <laughs> and special things planned for that part of the journey. Yeah. Again, in keeping with this idea in this mindset of wanting to keep it as, as real and honest and transparent for you guys as possible. And this series, Austin came up with this name and I love this name. It's titled parts unknown because as Austin stated earlier, we're working to shed light on some of the darkest, more unknown, more unspoken about pieces and parts and instances of this journey through tragedy and finding triumph within it. So I love that name and as much as I as much as it pains me that we're on the journey we're on and that you have to fight the things you have to fight I am immensely inspired by and ultimately empowered by the approach you've chosen to take with this because I know you said at the the beginning and it was interesting to hear you say this you you had stated that you don't know what you did to deserve such an immense outpouring from the incredible community of people we have around us and I definitely can 
can relate to those feelings. But I think even still, you don't understand even quite just the amount of people who are watching you right now, following you, you know, have true concern and genuine goodwill for you and who are witnessing this journey you're on with amazement and and disbelief of how you've been able to approach it and how you've been able to work through it and how you've been able to create this triumph from the tragedy that's going on. And I think what I would offer, because this is something that's brought me comfort in my own journey, in those times where you ask the question, what did I do to deserve this? I think we can take that and we can change it to, I'm going to make sure I earn this. Touche. And when we, when we wake up with that and say, I'm going to look at all of these people that I know have given me so much, done so much for me, I'm going to try to earn that every day. Mm-hmm with my approach, with my message, with my dedication, and ultimately with your pursuit of the impossible. Amen to that. Absolutely, brother. (laughs) So, dude, I can't tell you how proud I am of you. I can't tell you what it means to have you here sharing this message, despite (laughs) how hard it is to go back to moments like that and to relive them. But it would be harder to go back to the person that I was two and a half years ago. Absolutely. Because that man could not have looked the oncologist in the the eyes and said, we'll continue. No, I would struggle to even use the word man as an identifier. So. And look who you've built now. Yeah. Yeah. And who who you're going to build throughout this process is um, so excited. Something immense for sure for sure so guys we appreciate you tuning into this episode we appreciate you joining us on this journey and we mostly appreciate everything you've done for us along the way helping us to spread this message to share in our mission and our vision to have this ultimate impact on the world and as always the number one thing we could ever ask for you is If this message, if this journey brings you something positive, we ask that you share it with as many people as you know that you think it would help them in their own lives, in their own journey, because that is ultimately the best way we could ever spread this message and fulfill this mission and vision that we have for everything we're doing with Impossible Performance. We do also want to take a moment to mention some of the incredible brand partners that we've had along this journey who have... uh, jumped on to help sponsor us for not just this podcast, but for the Columbus marathon race where we help kids find hope in their journey and help them realize their strength in the face of immense battles. And uh, those brands are King and fifth. Who's been with us nearly since the beginning of everything we've done. Austin and I are wearing both their hats. Now Um, we are never not wearing these hats. We never wear anything else. (laughs) They are the best products we've ever encountered for both training, for running, for speaking, for formal engagements. They have a product for everything. And you guys can check them out at kingandfit.com. Their link is in the show notes. Use code. It has changed. It used to be impossible performance. Um, We actually had a, unfortunately had a leak where that link got leaked onto some not so good sites. And uh, it corrupted the link as well and so now we've updated it they were incredible in stepping in getting everything corrected getting everything figured out and uh it has been updated to performance 10 is our new discount link with king and fifth so if you guys were using that old one make sure you update that link um, and we'll still get you your 10 percent off at checkout on any of their products and the new company we've started to work with which we are so excited to bring you guys you see them all over the table here because we pound these things <laughs> and they've been it's an incredible pr- product i i hate to call it an energy drink because it's not an energy drink mm-hmm. it is a performance drink you know we don't we're not impossible energy we're impossible performance yeah. <laughs> and uh, while caffeine can be a, a driving motivating energizing source we have thankfully now to kinetic found something that's even better something that drives 
performance and as their mission is gives you momentum for life it is a patented blend uh, of ketones that are direct fuel to your brain and give a great level of mental clarity and focus especially in that morning time when you wake up kind of groggy you want to hit that coffee you want to hit that energy drink we found that kinetic can provide the same and even better benefits without any need for caffeine there's no artificial flavors no artificial ingredients everything is natural zero sugar zero caffeine and it tastes amazing really, really good. the number one thing we hear every person we give this to is they're immediately blown away by how good it tastes tastes like you're biting into a real whole pineapple which is <laughs> just incredible don't, don't recommend but yeah. like, it tastes great <laughs> yeah you can get that in the form of a ready to drink performance enhancing can so guys check out kinetic use code impossible 10 at checkout to get 10 percent off their entire store get your cans in and uh, fuel that momentum for your life and everything you're chasing in it and i think i want to close by having austin give us a description of one of my favorite pieces of this whole series you guys have seen the thumbnail on this episode if you're listening you can see it on your phone if you're watching on youtube you can see it as you click on the video but it's a powerful thumbnail and it's something that's been a core central piece to Austin's journey since the very beginning of all of this and honestly even before and there's in part of this painting or sorry in part of this thumbnail there's a painting of train tracks leading to an unknown destination and I wanted to have Austin explain to you guys a little bit of what this particular piece of this series and this message means to him because I can promise you guys there's nothing we do by accident. Every little unique quirk or um, piece of this entire show and our message and everything we do is all incredibly intentional and has deep levels of meaning within it. And I thought there was no more fitting way for him to close this first episode than by, or this first day, cycle one, day one, than by him giving you the explanation of what this piece means to him and what it's going to mean throughout the entirety of this journey. Lots Frau. It's a phenomenal two very large pieces of canvas put together. And the incredible nature about it is that the lower half piece has another sheet of canvas on top of it that was literally with a flamethrower burnt and left somewhat in contact beautifully placed together uh, upon the the firm sheet the the good sheet of canvas its motivation was from a visual of the railroad tracks leaving Auschwitz. And so within the description, within the motivation, and within the piece itself, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of disdain for what what existence means to you within that moment. And it really, really does strip life of all of its color and grandeur. But what I find to be so promising about this piece is that within all that color devoid of all of that searing noise you hear by just looking at it 
it hits you like like thunder that's nearby. Is that those train tracks lead off to somewhere? In my case, I'll make sure that I manufacture that those rail, that those rail ties lead to somewhere better. I see it as an opportunity to be willing to take this journey on and stay on track towards something absolutely beautiful and internally divine. Because at Impossible Performance, we are striving to build a global culture of strength, fostering a spirit of growth in constant pursuit of the impossible. Thank you for listening. And as always, be impossible.